some days you're not going to be as optimally ready to practice. But we do want to make sure that we don't just, you know, shrug off practice days because baseball specifically is a skill dominant sport, which means practice legitimately does make perfect. Welcome everybody. This is Scott Hassey with ITT episode 19. We've got Ryan Fair with us with the Cleveland Indians. If you are not following us on social media, it is just at Indiana Twins across the board. For YouTube, where we will upload this, it's youtube.com slash Indiana Twins. So it's kind of cool. We're able to, under the, under the show more section, um, right underneath the videos in YouTube, I'll have, this will probably be uploaded in the next day or two. And then um, within a day or two after that, I'll make sure and have all the notes and the topics, everything and the timestamps. So you'll be able to click around if you're watching this now and you have to miss something or see what we're covering. It's kind of like a little outline or a table of contents, so to speak to kind of jump around the video if you want to just watch certain components. So if you guys have any questions, you can also email us. It's just indianatwins at gmail.com. It'll probably be myself answering those questions and let us know if you ever need anything. For this show, what we are gonna cover is a ton about training. We're gonna dive a little bit into nutrition and then we're also gonna do our segment, the Twins Critique, where we talk a little bit about what our program has to offer and then we're going to get some expert opinion from Ryan on how we can kind of evolve and continue to improve our organization. And then at the end, kind of an extra credit, uh, I want to end and just give us as much time as we need to uh, comfortably talk about it, talk about mental health. So with that said, Ryan, go ahead and let's kick it off and just tell everyone about your baseball career path. Sure. Thanks, Scott. I appreciate you having me and, and yeah, you know, given giving me the opportunity to come on here and talk some shop with you, ask about the program a little bit and learn more, and then just have a, have a platform to, to kind of share this discussion. Really, really looking forward to it. Um, so yeah, like in terms of my baseball path, so uh, baseball is the only sport I've ever played in my whole life or been a part of. So when I was uh, four years old, I picked up a bat and ball for the first time and, and played basically every year from, from four years old until 18. I'm from central Florida and born and raised down there. So we get sunshine year round. So you know, whether it's good or bad, I, I did, uh, you know, early specialization at four years old and played played all year and couldn't get enough of baseball as much as my parents tried to get me to play other sports. So uh, played through high school, um, at which point I graduated from DeLand High School in DeLand, Florida. And right after that period, I I'd started working out with our assistant principal at the time, um, my senior year, and I was using the weight room. We, I'd work out every morning with him. And then I would, you know, go play baseball, you know, in, in the spring, in the afternoon, go to practice. When I graduated, I, I stayed local for one year at a, at a junior college or a state college. Um, and since I was right there at Daytona State College, I kept working out at, at, the, at the weight room. And the one day I was there, my, my head, head baseball coach who had been at the Land High School for about 15 years had gotten let go right after I graduated. And they brought in a new coach. His name was Andy Lyon. And he was getting a tour of the weight room basically on his first day, the day I happened to be, to be working out. So they were just showing him all the facilities around the land. And uh, I introduced myself, said, hey, I'm going to be around for at least a little bit, you know, if you ever need any help. And he goes, well, do, do you want to throw BP to our, uh, to our freshman team tomorrow? And so to give you an idea, I was, I was a pitcher in, in, in high school. Um, I threw cutters, <laughs> which is not what you want for BP. And I'd never throw BP in my life, but I said, sure, why not? was nervous as all get out the next day, but went and threw BP for that freshman team. And I never quit coaching ever since. So I basically been on a baseball field every day since uh, spent four years coaching at Deland high school for Andy Lyon on a volunteer basis while I continued to get my schooling from the university of Florida quickly learned that I wanted to go into the strength and conditioning field because as a baseball player myself, that felt like I had to work for every ounce of talent that I, that I could, that I could get. I fell in love with the training side of it more than the competition, to be honest. And so that's why I made it really easy to go into coaching for me. And so uh, my sophomore, junior year, got it, got an internship at Stetson University. And for those that aren't familiar, a, a decent baseball program or a very good baseball program down in, down in Deland, Florida, in my hometown, was able to intern there as a strength coach, uh, the first year they ever had a strength and conditioning program. So I was fortunate to go in and there was only a director and then there was myself as a college sophomore or junior as his intern, but needed to coach every day with him uh, because he would have to co cover another team and, and I would be in the weight room. So got a lot of opportunities to coach at a really young age. It was, it was really uh, impactful for me. 
in my development. My going into my senior year, the the uh, Los Angeles Dodgers were looking for a an intern strength coach uh, that was a student, which was unique at the time. A lot of teams weren't looking for student interns; they wanted somebody who was out of school. Um, so applied, had a couple connections, and you know, thankfully, networking helped me get my foot in the door there. Spent my summer out here in in Phoenix, Arizona, where I currently am, um, as an intern for the Dodgers, and then returned full time after graduating from the University of Florida as a full time strength coach with them. Uh, left professional baseball, was was homesick, moved back home. Eventually, ended up at, with the New York Mets in Port St. Lucie, Florida. Spent about a you know a half season there, I would say, maybe a little bit less, but had an opportunity then to return to my alma mater, DeLand High School, where I volunteered all that time and went to school and, and start their strength program for the first time. They, they had not had one before. So I uh, spent a year building that um, with some really great people, but then the Cleveland Indians called and, and there was an opportunity that I could not uh, turn down and moved back across the country to Phoenix, Arizona, where I currently am. And uh, it just, uh, I'm in my fourth year now as, as a performance coordinator with the Indians. Well, that's an awesome story. And I want to go, I want to, um, kind of expand on some of that because I know we've got some of our younger instructors and coaches that have an interest in continuing to expand their career and move on to baseball. <clears throat> so tell me a little bit more about those internships. Like for the first one at the, at the college level, were you, did you just research on job boards? Was it something that happened pretty quick? And then with the Dodgers, you said you had some connections, but was that after the fact that you found out? How'd you find out about it? Like how did that process go? Yeah, I would say the overall theme of both of those experiences was networking and probably like naively networking in the sense of I was just going to cold email and call as many people as I could, whether there was a post or not. And basically my thought process was if I email, if I email 30, 40 division one strength coaches, because in my mind, that's what I wanted to be was a, was a D1 strength coach one day and asked, hey, can, even if it's not an official internship, can I be a fly on the wall for a day, for a week, for a month, for as long as you'll have me? If I could just get one or two of them to respond out of 30, well, it didn't cost me anything. I'm not going to embarrass myself because they're not going to remember me five years from now, four years from, from then when I enter the field. And, but hopefully somebody gives me an opportunity. Uh, had a couple you know, good conversations with people that, that could have been potentially something, maybe. But ironically when it comes to Stetson that was in my hometown I was just googling do they have a strength strength and conditioning program and they just so happened to start one because they hadn't had a football team but the fall of 2011 they they started their football program up and so of course now they had a strength and conditioning program they built a weight room and, and an athletic performance center and I just happened to come across a strength coach's profile it probably had only been on their their athletics page for a few weeks but reached out to him he said come down tomorrow and I was just willing to come in and he basically said can you be here at 5 a.m the next day and and that was that you know so that was a kind of a luck met the op you know luck met the preparation in terms of lucky to find Stetson just opening a program and they had no other assistance so he just needed any help he could get so it was an automatic yes and it was in my hometown but had sent out so many emails prior to that the one with the Dodgers is interesting because I kind of skipped through some of this but I was coaching travel ball every summer while I was doing my undergrad so I was coaching year round I just knew no matter what this would all one I enjoyed it but two it'll it'll pay off like I, I had faith that this would build the resume somehow somebody would appreciate the fact that I coached year round for four years during school and so we we were a part of uh the uh MB uh oh my gosh uh the, so Andy Barquette, if you're familiar, he was the hitting coach for the Red Sox, and now he's an assistant coach with uh, UCF. He had a program um, that he started for, for travel ball, and that was back when he was a double-A manager for the Marlins. So he was in Jacksonville, Florida. And so I was a coach with that travel ball program. And so because he had that team in the summer, he hosted our four or five teams. It was 16 and 17U at their stadium and just did like a clinic and some inner squad scrimmages. Right. Yeah. And so while I was there again, just kind of that like naive, you know, networking, you know, I, I, we were watching batting practice and I just walked up to the manager, Andy Barquette and said, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm Ryan, you know, can I meet your strength coach? And he was like, I, yeah, I guess. Sure. Jeremy McCann was their strength coach in double a spent, spent that day with him. He gave me his hard drive full of everything he'd ever collected in terms of books and everything. He said, take all this and learn and then go read this, that, and the other. 
And he said, you know, reach out to me in the fall when it's the off season, maybe we can spend some more time together. Of course, I took him up on it, ended up uh, spent a weekend with him. He taught me a ton. And then a couple of years later, when I applied for that job with the Dodgers, I had remembered, oh, he had been with the Dodgers prior to, to the Marlins. So I reached out to him. He didn't know the coordinator or the staff. It had been several years, but he, he made a couple calls and emails on my behalf, which got me the interview. And thankfully, I, I, didn't, I guess I didn't fall on my face that much, was able to, to secure that internship. But it all started with, you know, just not being afraid to walk up to somebody and, and introduce myself and, and hope it would turn into something, or at least with the, with the regard that at least I'll learn, if anything. Yeah. Do you, because you've talked about, correct me if I'm wrong, you're, like myself, a bit of an introvert, correct? Absolutely. <laughs> so being an introvert and just walking up to people and introducing yourself, Talk a little bit about, I mean, how'd you do that, being an introvert? I find that incredibly difficult when I go to conferences and that kind of thing. So you're talking about, you know, pro coaches and that kind of thing. What's going through your head? How'd you do that? Yeah, I mean, I definitely get, you know, anytime there's a, uh, an opportunity to kind of speak in front of people, I, I get nervous and, and you know, all the, all the normal things. What I've learned about myself as an introvert specifically is it's more about how I recharge. I've, I've come to grips or come to terms with the fact that my career requires me to be more extroverted, but I know who I am in that role now. Now this is, you know, a decade into coaching. I know that I'm not the hype man that's going to be on the sidelines with the football team. And I'm not going to give the motivational speech. I'm hopefully just going to communicate really well and have the content knowledge to be able to support the athletes that way. Um, but when, when I get my downtime away from work, I'm going to need to spend some time uh, maybe away from people or just with a little less engagement and being in, in an environment where I don't have to be on still. However, a, a lot's come along with that. So being in, in a place for, for several years where you're comfortable around your staff and your players, I don't feel like I'm on as much as I used to be because I can just be myself. So that's really helpful. But even when you go back 10 years and I was like, you know, walking up to random people, I guess it was, I let my passion drive me. I knew what I wanted to become. I knew or in a sense knew what I wanted to become, knew the direction I wanted to go, knew I had no idea how to navigate beyond the first few steps in that direction. And I really wanted to learn. And, and that was going to have to pull me out of my shell a little bit. And then once you get the ball rolling, right? Like once you start having those interactions, once you start public speaking and, and things like that, I, it's become, at least for me, a lot easier. I, I've become accustomed to it. So um, there's still those days. And especially like when we, when we have our, our time now we're spring training, let's say, and you're working seven days a week, 12 to 15 hours a day. It, it can be trying, you know, uh, especially when I go home, cause I'll be mentally just, you know, gone and there's really no time to recharge, but I now I know those times are coming and I recognize that I know how those, how I'm going to respond. And that may be a challenging time of the year for me, but then the rest of the year is, is easier. If that makes sense. Yeah. No, that's good. Um, and I'm glad we went into that a little bit more because, again, with a couple of the coaches that we have and just being able to share some of this, I think it's that's super valuable information because you hear networking, you hear apply for jobs, but the reality of it, people just can't seem to grasp sometimes. And like, man, that seems really nerve wracking or I don't know if I can do that or I don't know when or where. So I appreciate you sharing that. Before we get into training, though, I want to ask you more of a lighthearted question. I didn't put it in the notes. This isn't meant to surprise you. It's not a crazy question. But um, has there ever, not has there ever been, when was a time that you remember where being in pro ball or even at the collegiate level where you kind of just took a step back and you were like, man, this is just really cool, like getting to do this or getting to meet this person or be at this place or that kind of thing? I can remember the, well, there's two moments and one, it, it was, a, one was gratifying and we spent four years building a program at Deland High School and trying to do things the right way and telling our players that if they bought in, we would, we would see success. And we all knew behind closed doors that success didn't necessarily mean win, but we wanted to win, right? right. We, looked, you know, we cared about graduation rates and we cared that the things were done the right way and that our players became young men ready, ready to go out into the world. 100% was our focus. But there was part of you that like every time we did our Omaha challenge, which we called it the JetBlue challenge, because you played at JetBlue Park for the state championship. There was part of you that was like, I want to see this happen for the guys. And we, the fourth year, which is my last year coaching there, 
we made it. And, and we made it to the final four. We didn't win the, the state title. We lost one nothing in the semis. But it was that moment of walking into that stadium going like, oh, my gosh, the last four years in the fall, we did this JetBlue challenge. And, and here it is. And like, even right now, I get goosebumps, you know, because it was such a cool moment for those guys. But in terms of just like a starstruck type moment, our, my first year with the Dodgers or, or my first my full time year in spring training, going into a meeting that was run by Don Mattingly with all the minor league players and Mark McGuire. And they were running, they were running this, you know, how to like utilize video to break down pitching and hitting. And those guys were there and they come and they sit down and the staff's on the side of the room. So when they sit down, they're, they're really close. And I remember we had a guy, uh, I was terrible. I don't remember his name, but he was, had been a minor league vet, like had been up, had been so close several times. It's probably close to 30. Uh, and I remember thinking, like, I, I, I leaned over to him, like, you know, is it bad that, like, I want to ask for Mark's autograph? And he goes, is it bad that I want to, too? <laughs> you know, like, we were both <laughs> in that same mindset. Like, I can't wait for that 30 for 30 to come out in a couple of weeks because my earliest baseball memory oh, yeah. was watching Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire duke it out for, for the home run title. So that was, that was one of those moments where I said, like, wow, like, this is kind of cool. <laughs> That's awesome. That's, that's a really fun story. It might be one of the more fun stories anyone shared with me. Um, so let's get, let's get into training, and I'm going to preface it with something that I loosely quoted from listening to one of your podcasts, or it was somewhere. It might have been in one of your articles that you wrote. Um, you basically talked about how game day performance is not more important than practice performance. Uh, I think that's super vital and important. And all the things that we're going to talk about for training that prepare you for performance are not the actual game day. So I think it's good to kind of set it out that way. So the first thing I want to talk about as we kind of dive in a little bit and we can get into some of the more nuts and bolts of it because I think people are interested. Um, you talk about training age. What is that? And then can you kind of take us along maybe just briefly with each of those stages, what they look like and kind of the importance of starting at, you know, stage zero basically. Yeah. And I think I like that you prefaced it with that. I, I don't know that at that, I don't remember saying those words, but I think it's, it makes a ton of, a ton of sense. And, and before we dive into that specific question, um, to, to add some context to that, because it's important even with our, with our players, so much is made of readiness for, for competition. And even if we pull out what level of, of, of competition you play at, in my mind, you know, unless you're, competing for the college world series or the equivalent like you're at the collegiate setting where wins and losses matter in season late in the season or unless you're at the major league level you at to a certain extent have to maximize your readiness for for for, for practice as well and some days you may not have that readiness like that's the, the point of periodization and or or planning the loads that we place on players some days you're not going to be as optimally ready to practice but we do want to make sure that we don't just, you know, shrug off practice days because baseball specifically is a skill dominant sport, which means practice legitimately does make perfect. It matters how the quality of your swings in the cage, the quality of your mechanics when you throw. So if we just say, Oh, all that matters is how I perform. Uh, you know, we think about a starting pitcher. Let's say if you're at, in the, at the high school level and you're, you're only making one start per week. Well, there's six days in between that can actually add up to you performing at a much higher level or at the end of the season being a better player than you started that season. And then when you boil it down to the developmental levels of like middle school, high school, minor league baseball, off season in, in, collegi in the collegiate setting, like you got to like maximize your development time. So I think that's, you know, like I said, I don't, I don't remember typing that, but I, I do agree with it. So um, with that in mind, talking about like the developmental curve there, yeah, it's such a great question because I was just talking to somebody the other day about their son who's a football player and talking about his size as a freshman compared to some of the other freshmen on the team. What you have to consider for age is you, you have your, your chronological age. So how old is how old are you? Are you 14? Are you 15? Are you 16? You have your biological age, which is it doesn't matter what your birth certificate says. This is what your hormones and your body actually says. This is, this is the maturity that you're at. So physical maturity. And then there's training age. How long have you been training? And realistically, the factors that make the most contribution to how you develop are the latter two. It's, it's not your chronological age. The only thing that, that really happens with chronological age is 
if you're born later in a season or like in the calendar year or earlier, it might affect how, where you rank versus your competition, so to speak, in terms of maturity. But the, it's the other two factors that, that, that will fluctuate. So you could be 15 or 16, but if that athlete hasn't matured in the sense that those hormones are kicking like somebody else who's, I mean, you can see that, right? When you might have the, the five foot two, 130 pound or 110 pound 15 year old versus the 5'11", 180. 15 year old you know that was that was the discrepancy we were talking about with our uh with the football player the, the dad i was talking to then you have training age which is you know how long have you been training the earlier in your in your training as as you know you know the easier it is to develop a lot of physical qualities especially if your body from a biological standpoint is primed for those things so what i mean is early on in your training for you and me if we were if we hadn't trained much scott we'd probably put on muscle mass very quickly. And then that would diminish over time. The 14 year old that probably doesn't have testosterone kicking like the rest or the 12 year old, well, we could train all we want for muscle mass. We're probably not going to get a lot of it. However, still can get stronger, can get more coordinated because that window for adaptation in the early stages of training is, is huge. The body just has not seen that stimulus before that stress. And when we put that stress on the body, it is forced to adapt right away. So those are the considerations when you look at like age that definitely factor in. So when you're looking at, you know, you know, when you're looking at your son or daughter or if you're, or if you're, you know, at that age where you're like, man, like I'm just so much smaller than my, you know, so-and-so, you know, maybe it just hasn't kicked yet. So keep working hard, learn the training habits that help you develop as a, as an athlete and all the routines that help you develop as a person. But take the pressure off yourself to know that maybe your body's not ready to shoot into the next phase of development. Well, that makes sense. So you always hear beginners gains. So, you know, that's kind of that, that first stage. So beyond that, um, cause I think, you know, strength and conditioning the whole world with that most high schools or most, most athletes who take their sport somewhat seriously have been exposed and are kind of within that first year. So past year one, what is it that guys should be looking at? And I didn't write this in my questions, but I'm even thinking of someone who has, let's say, a program at their school, but everything's just super basic. They don't feel like they're progressing past that basic level. The coach or the teacher, whoever, is, isn't able to get them next to that next level. What's the next level past? Like, hey, I know the foundational movements and all those things. What do I do next to progress? Yeah. And, you know, you hope that you have a resource of somebody who can help you figure out what the answer is, because sometimes there's better answers than others. But I think you want to start uh, to realize or you want to start to apply um, the things that your body ultimately needs. And that's where, like, if you have a resource like a coach who can assess you and tell you what you need, that's the ideal. But if not, you start to you start to look at, OK, what is plateauing? And why might that be plateauing? So I'm not getting any, any bigger and I need to get bigger. Well, okay. You know, are you eating enough? Are you, are you intaking enough protein on top of just the pure calories? Okay. No, you're not. Well, what are things that we can do to, what are routines that we can do to support that? You know, I'm not getting stronger. Well, you know, what does your lifting look like beyond that? Something that, that I feel like looking back at when I worked with, you know, high school athletes in the high school setting that I wish we did more often is I wish we sprinted more and I wish we jumped more and we skipped more and we, we did more plyometrics. Like, I think that's an area where now when you look at strength programs, it's such low hanging fruit to work with a high school age kid and develop strength because so many things get brought up with strength if you haven't trained before. So typically athletes get faster, they jump higher, um, they throw harder when they introduce strength training for the first time they get more coordinated they um and some of that has to do with just the, the physical maturation but also a lot of it's just that big window of adaptation and so i always chase the low-hanging fruit with those guys and we just you know we just spoon fed them you know proper strength and and really try to develop those qualities i wish we sprinted more i wish we jumped more i wish we tried to really apply force more quickly into the ground or into the objects that we're trying to project. So I, th I would think if you're not, if you're not doing that yet, I think that's an area to, to look into because I don't think anywhere where you might taper off one day and, and when you're 30 and you may not strength train as hard in your career, um, you probably won't ever stop trying to be powerful and explosive because that's what's really going to translate to baseball ultimately. 
got to have the base of strength. But as you start to really go beyond that, the ability to effectively sequence your sprinting, because all it is at the end of the day, it's, it's putting force into the ground, as much force as you can, as quickly as possible in a coordinated sequence. It's all pitching and swinging is. It's just done in a different way in different planes. Yep. No, that makes sense. Um, so, and you talked a little bit about things that you wish you would have done. So what are the things that you think get, what are the movements, let's say, that you get undertrained? Because I know, you know, reading your material and a lot of the good coaches out there that have a progression where it starts at just the movement and then progresses to the bar, or maybe it's even PVC pipe in some things, or the bar, or kettlebells and lot progression. What are some things that are really undertrained? And talk about the importance of just movement quality. Yeah, so so I'm gonna give you one exercise up front that it's that I'm all I'm all for trying to sell this one, and then I'm actually gonna flip the script a little bit on you. So the first one I think the push-ups underutilized. I think I think a a properly uh, performed push-up through a full range of motion with really good postural integrity. So just keeping good posture throughout the movement, and then be able being able to be on your on all fours like that and move into different positions while you're in all fours which would be the next progression for me beyond just doing a simple push-up i think is is vastly underutilized I, how much you bench or dumbbell press or landmine press or whatever it, it definitely matters it, you know or it can contribute to your development but i don't care how much you dumbbell press if you can't do a proper push-up because you're missing out on so so many positive qualities that could impact an athlete and just your ability to move. And so looking at movement quality, again, you, if you lay on a bench and you're pressing, you could probably, you know, maybe you work your way up to pressing 100s and that's, that's awesome. Um, but the bench is supporting your weight. So when we get down to the floor and all of a sudden you're working against gravity to try to align your spine in, in neutral and being able to move in and out of neutral and being able to uh, fully push push that floor away and engage kind of the serratus and so getting all sciencey but basically just getting into the right positions um, that is going to tell me more about your ability to to produce force safely which is ultimately I think what what matters the most when you're in the weight room just to be able to produce force safely now to flip the script a little bit on you so we talked about what to do after the first couple of years when training gets stale I'm going to now go the other direction. So instead of getting more complex, I'm still very much a, a firm believer of doing the basics and doing them really, really well. Um, so being able to squat, lunge, hinge, push, pull, um, and reach. Those for me are, are, are huge. Being able to brace and, and stabilize and then being able to find tension and breathing properly too. All those things, they all for me come – come together and I think we could actually spend less time training and, and one of the big pushes and pulls of, if you've ever been in that environment where like the strength coach and maybe the the baseball coach don't see eye to eye they're all competing for time because we only have so much time with our athletes which is a very real uh constraint is, is time um you can save a lot of time as a, as a strength coach or just as an athlete training if you spend I'd rather I'd rather do eight sets of squat and do them well and have the right progression to it and with good like movement integrity then do three sets of squat three sets of lunge and i'm going to add a rotation on this one and then a press on this you know the complexity may be good for something but you're probably not using your training time efficiently so uh you know in in professional baseball a lot of times our lifts have to be you know relatively concise so even on or or our athletes come in super fatigued and what do we do? We, a lot of times we chop off the bottom of their lift. We organize that workout to where the most important things are up top. And then we pull away all that extra volume that really is like, you know what, like, does it matter if he does a, a lateral lunge today with a 25 pound kettlebell? Probably not like good movement, but you know what? He did a lot of moving laterally today, throwing a baseball. He'll be okay. But Hey, like we need you to use whatever energy you have to spend the next 25 minutes hitting three or four intensive sets of a reverse lunge and to do them the best you can. And even if that requires more rest so that you can come back and keep hitting the same loads. Um, so movement quality, you know, with less load, but just focusing on building this literacy for movement should always come first. But when you get to the point where there's actually some loads involved, 
I like to keep it simple. And I, I, you know, you'll see that in my own training. And then you'll see that with, with a lot of the athletes that, that I've worked with is we try to do the really simple, really, really well. And then when we get past that point and training gets stale, um, progress starts to diminish. Then we start to, to branch out and figure out what, what's missing. I'm glad you said that. And yeah, I was going to say watching your own training, I've seen you. Yeah. A lot of the moves you're doing, it's just the ones you said, it's squatting, it's lunging, it's pull, like, it's very simple. And you had talked about you're what, nine, 10 years into your training, correct? Yep. I mean, that speaks You're yeah, you're a man of your word there. You're speaking to what you're teaching um, or you're doing what you're teaching. And it, it reminded me of, I think it was like four years ago, I heard about, I think it's strong lifts where it's like the five by five. Um, there's a, there's a website and they've got mm-hmm. programming, basically squat, deadlift, press. There might've been another one. Um, and or it might've been row too, but basically it took and had an app and everything. And I had heard it was a pretty good program to maybe recommend to some of our players that don't have any access to any type of coach or anything like that, but to give them some type of resource that might generally speaking, you know, behoove them or benefit them. So I remember doing it. And it started out like bare bones weight. I think it recommended like 65 pounds. I don't know if I started that low or maybe like 75 or 85, but like super, super lightweight for squatting. I said, you know, I'm just going to do this program from start to finish to see what it's like. So that when I recommend it, I have a lot more insight with it. So I remember starting with that really, really lightweight. And as you know, cause you add like five pounds each mm-hmm. time you do it and you're doing it multiple times a week, the same exact workout. So after, you know, three, four weeks, you're up quite a bit more. But I just remember thinking to myself, like six weeks in, nine weeks in, 12 weeks in, like, I feel like I still, while doing the squat, am not always confident based on the day or the amount of weight that this is the most comfortable and best position for my feet or my knees or my stomach or my positioning. So with all that said, Talk about, because you mentioned in in the past and a little bit here too, how varying up, whether it's timing, your tempo, or your weight, or your implements, how that can really benefit. And we've already started to talk about it, but go a little bit more deeper on how you can vary your training and get so many different um, benefits out of that. Yeah, so I think the, the most simple way to put it is that your ability to handle multiple types of loads at multiple speeds at vi- with varying loading positions and, and, and variations will ultimately mean that your, your overall ability to move load or just to move, you're increasing that movement literacy. Now, that doesn't mean every day like, oh, I'm in a front squat today. And oh, I'm going to, you know, like, it's not variety for variety's sake, but it's, it's it, over time, like, because, you know, now I've been, I've been working, you know, working out for since I was probably 16. So we're going on 12 years now. And like realistically writing my program as if I was a strength coach or as a strength coach for now 10 years, like over the course of that time, like I've switched lifts to try to get better at them. So it's not just, okay, I'm going to throw a lot of variety. It's, Hey, I'm going to spend the next four or five months low bar back squatting. Cause I'd never done it before. And Oh man, like, I feel like I'm shaking all over the place and I might, I feel like I'm not, I'm lifting less weight. I thought I was supposed to move more weight learn that movement and now it's a new pattern or, or, or uh, movement that I can do competently. It just expands my library of things that I'm able to do. But ultimately um, there's so many different ways that those can benefit you too. So where you load the weight can, can uh, shift the focus on different, different parts of your body um, and also be more mechanically advantageous or healthier for you. So for example, part of part going through training uh, a big part of it is learning about yourself. So your coach is going to be there to help you, but ultimately you're going to probably change coaches a lot over the course of your career. You need to have a, a good understanding of what works for you. Well, I've recently learned, you know, in the last few years, like I can only, uh, I can only back squat for so long before I start to get a little bit of a hip issue in the front of my hip. I've, essentially I just get like impingement because I get a really big arch in my back when I back squat. Ultimately, if, if my body was, was set up for that, maybe that wouldn't happen. But, you know, maybe I'm sitting at a desk too much, so I'm, all, I'm already just in bad postures or whatever, and, and that beca- becomes problematic. So I know I can, I can put that in, but then I know that I can pull it out. And if I put a front squat in there, a front squat gets me into this really neutral or stacked position, really healthy position. 
It doesn't feel great on my ankles because I have a screw in my left ankle, but it's still something that ultimately helps me unload from a heavy phase of back squatting. And I can go into, into, uh, into something that still places a lot of load on my, on my body and, and I can get stronger with being able to do different tempos. Um, they're going to allow you to actually target different qualities. So early on, I, I like to use, you know, what's called eccentrics, which of course you're familiar with Scott, but just controlling the lowering portion, like let's say in a squat going down very slowly. And then I might use, utilize an isometric where I hold the bottom of the squat for three to five seconds. And then I would come back up and I would do that to teach movement. Cause very early on with a lightweight for an athlete that's never, uh, never done some of these movements before one doing those eccentrics and isometrics give them the challenge that they're seeking because if you just do body weight and you just do reps they're gonna look at you like coach give me more you know dad give me more but the eccentric and isometric makes it challenging but also helps them move past that baby deer phase as their uh or baby giraffe phase as their as their body's growing where their legs are going all over the place so we hone in on that technique but then when you, when you talk about, you know, some, some seasoned athletes that are doing eccentric phases where they're focusing on the, the down phase, they might actually use more weight than they're capable of pressing up. So they might squat with 110% of their max. So 10% more than they can do on their own and have people help them get back up to the top because you can lower more weight than you can raise back up. And what that does is that really targets the nervous system and forces it to adapt to get stronger. Meanwhile, moving a lighter load as fast as you can, and maybe with a, without a pause in the bottom and doing it safely, but using a little bit of that plyometric effect and making it ballistic trains more for, for power versus strength. So as you open up all these different speeds that you can move at with different loading patterns, not only are you fitting it to what you individually need, for example, again, I have a screw in my left ankle, so my, my ankle mobility is not great. I can only front squat for so long, so I need other variations. But also, if I can learn to do heavy eccentrics, I can one day increase my strength even more when I hit that plateau of just doing normal squats. So again, just, just to reiterate, it's just opening up this library of training methods and movements that you can use in your training. Because my hope for everybody that, that is listening in that's an athlete and that everybody that I work with is that you have the longest career possible. So if you're 14, I hope you're still playing 16 years from now. And so I hope you're still training 16 years from now. But you're training 15, 16 years from now or even four years from now is going to look a lot different than what you're doing right now. So my next question, again, is not one I wrote down, but because I'm enjoying how you communicate and how you teach things in a simple way, which I've prefaced a lot of people that I've had on these shows with, hey, let's try to um, educate in the best way we can. So if we can't explain it to you know, a fourth grader, then it's probably going to be over the heads of a lot of our audience. So because you're doing such a good job teaching, I'm going to ask you to break down something else that we didn't talk about that I think can be confusing for some people. And also I think a lot of people just don't talk about it and that's the central nervous system. So how do you take that into account with training for your athletes? How do you explain that to them? Or maybe you don't really get into the nitty gritty of it or the science, but how do you explain how the central nervous system um, can get taxed, how you can utilize it, best to you know what it's capable of and have them understand that and then relate it to what they're doing in their training yeah that's that's an awesome question and uh it's something like i personally take a little bit of pride in uh like training the nervous system because i've been at some really light weights like i've been up to you know 185 pounds of my own body weight and lifted and i've been at 145 and have tried to get as strong as i can at that light weight and and whenever you see a a lighter athlete in terms of body weight who can move a lot of a lot of load so shift a lot of weight typically means they have really good nervous systems or or it's efficient for moving a lot a lot of weight so it may not be great nervous system may not be primed to move very fast or, or anything like that or very coordinated but can move a lot of weight um so so when i was learning to get as strong as i can at a lighter weight and as that scale ticked down but the load ticked up it's something that I've, I felt that I was able to do well for my own body. But to break it down, so the nervous system, uh, and I'm sorry for anybody that already understands this, but I'm going to keep it really simple. Um, the nervous system is going to include, um, you know, your brain, brain stem, spinal cord, and all the nerves that go out to the muscles. And so you'll hear people talk about the central nervous system, which was just the, the, the beginning portion of that. So your brain, brain stem, and, and spinal cord. Um, the central nervous system dictates your body's ability 
to move weight and to move fast. I mean, it does way more than that, but if we're just talking in a sporting and training sense, that's its main job is can, can we move a lot of weight and can we move very fast and can we be coordinated in that? So it's, it might be great that you can lift up a lot of weight, but if you pull with your back before you pull with your legs, well, you're going to end up with herniated discs. So it doesn't matter how, how strong you were. So the coordination matters as well. And the way that I explain it to athletes who do want to know, and sometimes we'll do this in the group setting, but other times it's just on one-on-one conversations that the athletes are receptive to learning more about it, is I think of it like as a big weight room for us. Like we, it's like almost like a, an airplane hangar, you know, or so if you think about a warehouse, anything where there's a lot of a big room with a lot of lights. And so the nervous system is going to control the ability to turn on a lot of lights, the speed at which those lights turn on, and then how coordinated they turn on. Do they all turn on at once or do they turn on one strip at a time? And so when we train heavy, we're training the body to turn on as many lights as possible. And what's happening is the nerve, the, the brain, brain stem, all that is, is sending messages through the nerves to the muscles. And every muscle has a bunch of fibers in it and every fiber has a lot of uh, nerve fibers uh, innervating it or connecting to it. And so when I tell, when I tell my uh, my bicep that I want to lift a lot of weight. I'm going to put a lot of weight in the bar and curl as much as I can. The heavier that load is, the more of those fibers have to connect to the muscles and, and shoot an, uh, literally an electrical impulse. So just like the lights. So if I want to move something heavy, I want to turn on all of the lights. I want them all on. If I want to move quickly, as you can imagine, you want all the lights to turn on fast. So I don't want them to dim, like to slowly turn on like a dimmer light. I want them on fast. And then if I want to all of a sudden, if I want to coordinate it right, you know, maybe in, in some cases for the squat, I want one row, then another row, then another. And if, and if I'm actually the better example would be if I'm pitching, it's definitely sequenced. I want the lower body to go, then the hips, then the trunk, then, you know, then the shoulder. And it moves in a coordinated fashion that way. But then in other times when you're just, I'm trying to pick up this car off a of baby, like, you know, I, I need as much force as I can as, as quickly as I can. It's all at once. So we want all the lights on. So when we train and we're training the nervous system, we want it to be efficient. So we want all the lights to turn on. We don't want to have one dead bulb. We want them all to turn on fast and we want it to be in whatever coordinated sequence that we're looking for. And so sometimes that's where like coming back from injury, not only maybe are you weaker, but there might be something that causes that sequence to change. So an athlete might be hundred percent healthy now and they may have all the strength that they used to have, but because of some of the time they spent down or, or something that's going on kind of behind the scenes with the body, the coordination's off. So it's, I make it sound a little more simple than it is, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, try to progressively load the body more, try to learn to move faster and try to become more coordinated. And if you do that, you're, you're training the nervous system pretty well and it, and it works independently of how much muscle mass you have. Bigger, bigger athletes tend to be stronger, but it's the same reason why you can, you can look at a, uh, an Olympic lifting event and you can see a guy clean, at a, he's 130 pounds and he's cleaning 300 pounds. It's because that nervous system is, is elite. It's not because he has the most muscle mass. I love that explanation. I'm glad I asked that because that, I've never heard that explained that way. I've never heard anyone really try to tackle it in a good analogy. It was really, so is it safe to say then if you turn your lights on and off repeatedly day after day after day after day after day, eventually some of the light bulbs go out and you have to fix them and you might need to take a break? Yeah, yeah, that's that's and that's an extension of the analogy I've never I've never used, but it makes a ton of sense. And, and so your your body then, if we think about, let's take a step back. So we talked about the nervous system. You also have the musculoskeletal system, so that's the muscles and bones. You have the endocrine system, so that's the hormones. There's, there's your body has a ton of these systems, right? The, the two main ones that we could think of in training would be that the 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 nervous system, the musculoskeletal system. Well, they both also fatigue. They don't just work and, and work well, but they also can, you know, they can be trained and they can be fatigued. Whenever you train something, you're going to accumulate fatigue. The good thing is your body's pretty resilient. It'll bounce back. You know, you take a couple of days, you take, you know, if you do upper body to today, you can wait 48 to 72 hours and you can do upper body again and you'll be fine. What happens though is as we tax our body and we ask it for a lot of output and we don't give it a lot of input to recharge the batteries or to replenish the, the, the stores of energy in your muscles, something's going to give. And so, um, you know, whether that's, if you're, if sleep's not on point, hydration, nutrition, um, if, if you're just training excessively, 
not only is, is the nervous system fatiguing, but so is the musculoskeletal system. So is the, the, the uh, endocrine system. So the hormones aren't going to be able to work like they should. And that's where we get that like at end stage, like the worst that you can basically get is that true overtraining. Most athletes never get to overtraining, but you might feel demotivated. You might not lift as much weight this session versus last session because you're not as recovered. You know, things like that all will will add up and if you're in a you know if you're in an elite setting if you're working with you know at the highest level and you have a lot of resources we can actually measure those but a lot of times it's just asking yourself questions like how did I feel today um you know how did I sleep last night how's my nutrition been today and if all the habits like if you don't feel great and all the habits leading up to that aren't great and you don't feel like you can give it a hundred that day it, it may be a day to just you know just take a step back but really like that like that analogy of, of the lights eventually breaking or dimming or, or needing just to be, you know, because the other thing too, the, the last piece of it before I digress too much is your nervous system is broken up into two basically dimmer switches. So now this, this isn't really helpful, but so essentially you have your, your nervous system has a, what's called a, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic. The words don't matter, but basically if you've ever heard of the fight or flight, anytime you're in a stressful situation, which that can mean, Hey, like, you're starting in the state semifinal game or you're starting in your first varsity game and you're on the mound. Like that's fight or flight. You're going to be nervous, butterfly, sweating, all that. Um, if, if, uh, if, if the other system, the parasympathetic is what's called the rest and digest system. So that's when optimal recovery day off, I'm going to go lay by the pool. My body's just chilling. I'm taking all the nutrients I need through my food. I'm sleeping well body. The body shifts all of its resources to recover. And so the example I give athletes, and it's, you know, sorry, it's a little crude, but if you've ever gone into a game and, and you're, you know, we're 10 minutes to first pitch and you realize, man, I really got to go to the bathroom. Like, sorry for the language, but I have to pee. Like, I got to go. And all of a sudden something comes up, like coach calls you down to go to ask you some questions. And before you know it, it's time for first pitch. You got to go out. I know we've all been there where all of a sudden we've pitched four innings and we've never relieved ourselves and we've totally forgot about it. Also, our body has completely shifted all of its resources to focusing on the stressful event in front of them, not, you know, some of the other functions that aren't as important right now. So when you keep them, not only when you keep the lights, you turn them on and off all the time, but if you keep those lights on all the time, fight or flight's on all the time. We need to go to the other side of the dimmer switch or turn the other dimmer switch up and say, hey, I need to, I need to recover. I need to rest and digest and, and try to bring my body back down. Well, I'm, this is exactly why I'm doing this show, to be able to clip up these things and explain them simply um, to a lot of our athletes. So that was very well done. And to just kind of finish off a lot of what you were talking about from a nutrition standpoint, you talk a lot about in your um, blogs about under eating. So I think that kind of is self-explanatory, but then the solution for that. So a little bit on under eating and then the solution for athletes. Yeah. So uh, I think, a lot of people talk about hard gainers and there's definitely like, you know, there's, there's endomorphs and ectomorphs and there's, you know, your body's predisposed to, uh, to, to burn at a certain rate and you, you're a highly energetic kid. And, and, but, but at the end of the day, like the ability to put on, to put on weight and I'm not talking muscle or fat, but just weight comes down to input versus output. You know, are you taking in enough calories versus how many you're burning in a day? If you're losing weight, it, it really is pretty much as simple as saying you're not eating enough and you're burning too much. And if you're gaining weight that you don't want to gain, then you're probably eating too much and not burning enough. We could talk about the, the, the nutrients involved with that and, and what that actually, ha what actually happens. But if an athlete is biologically like mature, like if they've hit puberty and their body's ready to grow, the reason they're probably not gaining any sort of weight whatsoever is they're either not training at all um, and not eating enough, or they're just not eating enough. It's, it's either both of those things together or, or it's, it's the one on its own. But typically what happens with, I've seen with high school athletes is they, you know, the day just kind of gets away from them. They wake up and, and they don't want to get up early. So they may or may not have breakfast. Then they go into school. You know, they may grab a bag of chips from the vending machine or something like that between a couple of their early classes they, they'll have a lunch, usually, if, if they have the money to have lunch, they'll have lunch, but then they'll go into practice, and they'll practice from 2 p.m. until, you know, until 6 o'clock at night, and then go home, and they may have only had Gatorade in that time as a, as a caloric source, um, and then they hopefully have a, hopefully have a calorie bomb for dinner, but even if they did, like, even if your dinner's a thousand calories, like, these kids, they're, they're going all day long, 
So for those that can't gain weight, it typically just comes down to not eating enough throughout the day. And, and it, it ends up being a, an access issue. Like they just don't have it at their disposal. So in the same way that I, I tell, you know, athletes, you want to fix hydration, carry a water bottle with you. And every time it's empty, instead of throwing it away. And that's why, like, I know disposable water bottles, we don't want to go that route. We want to go, we want to go with, you know, the, the better, uh, for the, for the environment, but a disposable water bottle, you have two choices when you're done with it. You either throw it out or you fill it back up. It's that simple. So I tell athletes, keep a, keep a disposable water bottle with you, fill it up and you'll stay, you'll stay hydrated. You'll drink when you're thirsty. You'll fill it up when it's empty. Same kind of idea with food, pack something to take with you. And, and a, and a solution that tends to help, cause even it can still be tough is even if you don't have enough snacks throughout the day in your meals, look to have some toppings or something that's calorically dense because that bag of chips you had and that Gatorade that you had with your, whatever your lunch was, is not going to be enough. It's not calorically dense, but if you start adding fats and don't be afraid of them, but that means peanut butter or a handful of nuts or uh, sunflower seeds or olive oil, uh, cheese. If you add those as a topping to what you were already going to have, you've added a, a significant amount of calories right there without having to really work a whole lot. Cause you could probably get olive oil at your, in your lunchroom. I would think you can definitely get uh, cheese. You can probably, uh, you could probably get some sort of peanut butter from somewhere. So those are easy ways to just like add little tiny calorie bombs throughout the day. That's perfect. I think we've covered enough. So I do want to go into the twins critique. So, and I prefaced you with this a little bit. What the twins critique is, is a chance for me to talk about our organization, what, a little bit about what we do, who we are and the two most important things, and then get kind of some expert advice on ways that we can improve. If you think everything's perfect, then I think you're insane because nothing's perfect and we're always trying to get better. So with that said, our organization is all the way down from 8U up to 17U. And we've got college guys coming back. We've got multiple teams at different ages. And the two most important things for us are, number one, that we all speak the same language from top to bottom. And that, you know, kind of led us to having our own certification. You got a dog issue? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm sorry. No, I you're just, part of the live fine. show. She uh, she just wants some attention. So this is my basset hound. I apologize. She's no. been cooperating all day while I've been on Zoom since like nine in the morning. So um, hang, hang with them. But I'm, I'm going to keep her occupied. I apologize. Oh, no, she's doing awesome. That's part of the live show. It makes it more real. It doesn't need to be all staged. So we, we even started this year a coach certification in-house. So all of our instructors and our coaches are all teaching the same language. So if it's an 8U coach talking to one of our 16U players, they can speak the same exact language with whatever it is that we're talking about. Uh, and then the second thing that's really important to us is kind of it's a one-stop shop. So when you join our organization to play in the summer and all that, you're also getting an off-season program that's included in your fees. It's equivalent to those locally around us. Um, and I was telling you, Ryan, it's not a great way to make money, but it's like I said, it's all included in their fees and they're going to get, depending on the year, 18 to 20 weeks of hitting, pitching, performance training, mental training. There's a catching camp, outfield camp, infield camp. Um, I might've missed a couple things, but basically you get everything you could possibly need. So you don't ever have to go anywhere and look for something else. It's all unified and it's all there. So with that said, I do want to kind of pick your brain from a training standpoint. And again, I told you, you can ask follow-up questions to get more of a specific answer out of you. But we've got our guys in there at most probably two, very rarely three days for an hour at a time. Um, they're in there in a team setting. So it could be if attendance is low for their team showing up, maybe there's only five guys in there. Or if both teams are in there, there could be you know, 15, 16 guys in at a time in a confined room with a decent amount of equipment that they have access to. So what are some of the things that maybe you see you know, from your experience at the pro level or the college level or high school level, level where you see teams maybe not do such a good job in this area that you think is really important that a lot of people miss out on? Or what's some things that just from a time efficiency standpoint that you could see us doing more of regardless of whether or not we're doing it? Yeah, no. First of all, like, I just want to commend you guys on what you're doing, because a lot of what you're saying is are the kind of the pillars of what we're trying to do as an organization and what we're trying to live. So the ability to speak the same language and to collaborate and, and to build individualized programs like that's what we're trying to do. And that's 
Uh, and we're trying to do it at the highest level possible. And, and so are you guys. So it's, it's a shared mission that we have right now. I think it's really, it's, it's really encouraging. It's really exciting to hear. Um, without knowing, you know, you're, you know, I would hate to say critique or anything like that, but I do, you know, I, I'll give you a couple things that I think could be valuable and you might already be doing them, but then I want to ask you a question and hopefully that will uh, yeah. maybe be a little bit more valuable to be specific mm -hmm. to you guys. And maybe I can help, maybe I can't, but the first uh, the first thing is, uh, I think ultimately what we're trying to do, and, and, and for those listening, to, I think it's important to know that our athletes range from anywhere between 16 years old and, you know, until they retire. Um, the majority of the athletes that I personally see on a, on a daily basis here in Arizona at our player development complex are in that 17 to 22 or 23 age. We get, we get both sides. I've gotten, we've had 16 and then we've had 28. But typically it's that rookie ball age um, or, or, or just got drafted type age. Um, and something that, you know, I think could carry over between the ages is, is what we're, what we try to do is build more autonomous athletes, more independent athletes. And probably again, not really good for the money-making aspect of what you're trying to do because you're trying to basically, uh, make yourself as a coach obsolete, but trying to, to teach your athletes both like formally, like, Hey, like want you to learn about nutrition, hydration, sleep, uh, all the controllables, but also building into their program where they can get benefits from some of the things that they can do on their own. So for us, that's their prep work, our athletes every day. And so a couple of things that when we first come into the Indians, one of the things that you hear very early on, and it's hammered into their head as they go through their onboarding process is the value of routines. It's actually, we have an acronym, uh, it's GRIT, and G is for growth mindset, R is for routines, I is for individualized programming and T is for a team first approach. The R however is routines and they're going to hear it until they're tired of hearing it. But the idea is to develop a routine for everything that you do. And, and that's from a, from sleep to, to how you eat. Everything you do is, is routine. It's not, it's not habit. It's not accident. It's, it's a routine. And so we, you know, I've been a big advocate for this before, but the Indians thankfully are the same way is we use that prep time every day to get ready for the day as a chance to micro dose, whatever we're trying to work on, which again can save us training time. So where that lift, instead of that lift having to be 45 minutes to an hour, if it needs to be 30 minutes, that's okay because I may not need to spend as much time doing filler mobility work because not only did my prep work get me primed and ready for the day, but it also addressed some of the, the limitations that I have or, or some of the movement patterns that I struggle with. So uh, that's, that's one is just utilizing prep work as a way to micro dose and maybe Hey, I need to get more explosive. So at the tail end of that prep work, you're doing some jumps every day and it seems so little, but if you're doing prep work five, six days a week, well, that's five or six exposure to plyometrics that you're getting. And you may not have to do an extra plyometric session later in the week, you know, that it covers itself. Um, that's one, uh, the, the, the second part of that is just finding a way to get athletes to start to learn about themselves. So it's, it's part of becoming an independent athlete, but you know, if you do like a wellness, uh, a wellness journal, or even just journaling their workouts, you know, just, it's not to collect data. I mean, that's kind of a dorky way to put it, but at the same time, like everything that you write down is something that you can reflect back on. And whether it's something objective, like, Hey, today I moved, 200 pounds times four times the number of sets I did. So I did four sets of four, 200 pounds. So that's the load I moved today. And then when the next day, when I wake up, man, I was really sore for that session. So I'm going to note the next day was really sore, but you know what? I only slept three hours and I, and I felt dehydrated. I marked that. Well, the next time I don't feel so great again, I reflect and see if that was similar. And then I might find a trend, you know, you don't need some fancy program to tell you those things. You just need to have some awareness. So that's something there, but I'm going to flip it back to you real quick and ask, what do you think your biggest challenges are? Or what's one really big challenge that, that you're facing as you expand to do, to do these things at such a high level? What challenges do you think your athletes are facing or you as coaches and helping your athletes? I would say our number one challenge historically has been educating and part of it is we just haven't done a good job and we try to take ownership of that, but educating our parents so that they understand the importance of the performance training and exercise and that kind of thing. Because in the baseball world and a lot of youth sports world, um, 
lessons is kind of priority. You're, you're part of a team or maybe you're not, but you do lessons. Um, so for someone to seek out a strength coach or go to the gym is kind of that next step. But we try to argue a lot of the times that that should probably be your first step. Like you said earlier, it ends up just kind of making everything else kind of work itself out. If you can build a foundation of strength and movement and expulsion and all that. So probably our biggest struggle is to get that education piece out to parents so that they understand, hey, if you have to come to anything, it should probably be our PT, our performance training. So if I'm hearing you right, it's, it's the, 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 the kind of the, what you're running into is maybe being too scared or scared not being the right word, but fearful of missing out on baseball time to try to develop physically. Exactly. Yeah. I think that I, that's so real, not only in the high school setting, but really, you know, across the board until you can get that educational piece and get people comfortable with the idea of slowing down to speed back up. So if we can slow down now, maybe we can exponentially have a greater growth later on. And so I, that's, I don't have an answer for you or a way to like critique to help, but I can tell you that it's a real problem that, that we have at multiple levels. And I think if I had a message to send to parents that are listening, it's that by slowing down, sometimes you really can speed up on the back end of that missing out on, on one practice session from a skill standpoint may not be as big of a detriment as the benefits you're going to get from nailing consistent training, because that's the one thing about training that I think is it's kind of counterintuitive to skill skill development. Sometimes spacing is a good thing. Sometimes walking away from a skill for a week and coming back to it is, is a great way to, to test, to make sure that that skill has been reinforced, what your learning has been reinforced from a motor learning standpoint, whereas training it's really hard to take a break from training or to only train once a week and expect to get any better. There has to, there's your body needs the physiological, like compounding stress. So again, sometimes slowing down actually speeds you up down the road. It's just about taking that big picture approach of, Hey, I have four years of high school. I have, I have, uh, you know, so many opportunities throughout a year to get better. I need to make sure that I'm allocating that to the, to the right, to the right uh, methods. Well, that's, that's helpful. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, it's definitely probably one of our biggest issues. It always has been, but it's getting better because results end up, you know, telling the story and we're trying to tell that story with, Hey, you know, they showed up to this thing. They had results that there's a correlation there. Um, 100%. It's like selling, it's like selling our athletes to like uh, technology that, that they're not used to. It's you sell them the story of, I'm telling you, this is going to work and this is going to benefit you. And this is how, here's the value. I promise. But ultimately, like the, the, the results and the success become the, the biggest storyteller and the, and the selling point. You have to get to that point where those, you know, time allows you to get there, you know. Yep. So we'll shift it now. And this is kind of where we'll end. And if, again, at any time if your dog needs attention, I don't care if you have to walk off the screen or you have to take him to the potty yeah. or something. I want to be able to spend as much time as you have. Again, I don't want to go more than, I don't know, the next 20, 25 minutes, but um, to really talk on mental health. So. To kick it off, you know, we talked off, you know, before the show a little bit about it, and it's kind of been your mission the last couple of years, and we talked about, you know, when you kind of started to discuss mental health and your own journey. So I guess to kind of dive in, why is it important to you to start talking about mental health? Yeah, and I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to, to talk about it. I mean, first and foremost, it's not only – not only is it becoming more acceptable to talk about it so we know that more people have been struggling than we might have ever known, but we also know that we're all human. So there, whether it's truly a like, oh, I was clinically diagnosed with blank, or if it's just I'm going through a hard time, or I don't believe in myself right now, or I failed, everybody goes through at least one of those, right? If not more and, and multiple times. So being able to talk to, to, to help other people and to let them know that they're not alone, that's the main reason why I'm so passionate about talking about it. But something we discussed before this, this went live was the, <laughs> sorry, she dropped the ball. Just to let me know if she wants to play. Oh, no. um, <laughs> um, but one of the, um, you know, one of the things that's really helped for me is I could, I feel like I can be myself now. It's, it's, a, it's been a very big part of my life and, uh, you know, dealing with, with depression, um, and instead of feeling like I, I have to hide that because it's just one more flaw that I'm not happy with, 
it's just a part of who, who I, who I was and, and who I've become. And, and hopefully it becomes less of a pull and less of my story. Um, you know, for a long time it was, this is my story. And now I feel like, okay, that was a, ch a lot of chapters. That was the first part of my story. And now I'm here. Um, but the ability to talk about it has freed me up to just be myself and be more confident in who I am because I became very confident in who I was as a professional, but then would go home and just did not feel as great about who I was as a, as a person. And it was because I had, I was thinking in such a distorted way that, you know, it, it, it wasn't conducive to, to being overall being healthy. Yeah. How do you think, cause I, I listen and I don't, I don't want to pry, um, but I also don't want to gloss over it too much. How do you think you're able to tell your story best and have it relate to someone who's in the middle of it? Because let's say if someone on right now, high school on Instagram TV, watching this, going through something and here you are talking about it and they're just like, yeah, but this guy's this and he does this and he's with the Indians. Like, sure, he went through depression, but like I'm going through something real. Like, what's what can you tell that person about to relate with them and say, you know, I, I understand where you come from. Yeah. Well, first I can, I can definitely say that I may not know your situation and what you're going through. And I, and ultimately we never want to compare situations because you know what, like my, my insecurities about what I look like or, or who I am, like from an appearance standpoint, are like in the grand scheme of things mean nothing to the person who's struggling on the street and dealing with these things or has much bigger uncertainties as to whether or not I'm going to like who I see in the mirror. If that's if it's a, if it's a body image issue. So definitely never want to compare those things. And so that's the first thing. But the second is that I can just tell you that the, the worst I ever went through in my entire life in terms of dealing with depression was when I was probably the most, in a sense, equipped to deal with it because it wasn't at, it wasn't in middle school or high school. It was mid twenties and it was at a, you know, like I joke about it now is it was like a midlife crisis, like said, or sorry, a quarter life crisis. Cause I hit 25 and all of a sudden like life got really heavy for some reason. And, and I was going through the hardest personal time of my life, but professionally was taking off. Um, and not to say that I'm, you know, have taken off, but like in, in relative to where I was and where I was going, that was as things were really starting to progress. I was in one of the best places in my career up until that point. Things were, were going in the right direction. I felt financially secure, I, you know, relatively as much as you can in your middle 20s. And I felt professionally secure and felt challenged and, but personally just could not figure it out. You know, like it, it, it was, it was tough. Um, so I may not know what you're going through, but I know how it feels to be lost in all of that. Um, and sometimes there's concrete reasons. Like I feel this way because I went through a breakup or sometimes there's really abstract existential ones of, I have everything I could ever want and I'd still wake up empty. What's, you know, what's going on. And the fact is you're not alone. It's not easy. That's the other part of it is like, let's be super real about it. Like it's not easy. And the moment that you decide to try to get better and get help, the next day is not sunshine and rainbows. It's going to take time. It's just like the day you decide to commit to a new diet. Like the next day you're not thin, like it's going to struggle. You know, you're, 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 you're going to struggle a little bit, but you have the opportunity to one, get better still. As long as you're breathing, you can get better. And two, you have the opportunity to, to mold your life. You know, we're so fortunate to be born in, in a country and in a place where we have almost limitless possibilities. I hate to be really cliche about it. Maybe not limitless, but we have so many opportunities. And as long as, as long as you, again, are, are breathing, you have the opportunity to progress and be better and to become a better person, professional, or whatever you're striving to be. So you can mold your existence and your person still. So there's such a bright future, even if you can't see it. How did you navigate? Cause you know, I've heard you say this before. We talked about it before. You're not much of a self-help kind of guy. How did you navigate? You know, here, the options are typically, if you're going through something, you either keep your mouth shut and you just deal with it. You put your head down and you figure it out. Um, you reach out to a therapist. We can talk about that later too. Or you go to self-help and you go to that section in Barnes and Noble and you read books. You know, when I was going through some things in middle school and high school, eventually that's kind of the route that I got to 
later in college, kind of figuring out on my own and reading some books and just kind of figuring some stuff out. Um, I didn't go the therapy route, but talk about how you were able to kind of navigate that with some of your most obvious answers maybe aren't the ones that you're most comfortable with and what we're able to do. Yeah. Yeah. You hit the nail on the head. I'm, I'm a, I'm like a true skeptic. I, I, uh, I don't like thinking, you know, I'm predisposed to not being positive. Like I'm, I'm predisposed to being a little more negative, I guess, or I, that's how I had become, you know, in dealing with depression, it was a lot of negative thinking. So that's, that's already where my mind frame can go sometimes. But beyond that, thinking sunshine and rainbows to me doesn't resonate. For some people, thinking more positively really does. And what all that matters, all that matters is that you have a healthy, truly healthy way of thinking more rationally and getting out of that space that's not healthy. So if it is a self-help book, if that's what inspires you to, 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 to do something, that's great. It just doesn't resonate for me. I, I love to read. It's just not the genre that I, that I love. What's resonated with me, and it's taken trial and error to figure this out, was to think more, to think more rationally and to think uh, more neutrally. So a book, and this is, I was a skeptic. I didn't want to read it. Actually, I listened to this one. It was an audio book. Um, oh my gosh. It, it takes what it takes. And it's by the mental performance coach, uh, Russell Wilson's mental performance coach. So with the Seahawks, uh, he's been in a lot of other positions, but right now he, he basically just does like individual athletes case by case. And definitely, like I said, not a big, like to me, that sounds a little fluffy and I'm not a fan, but he talks about thinking. So for me, I like to think more practically and rationally. That's the way that when I went to therapy, that's the way we framed it. But the way he frames it is thinking more neutrally. So instead of like taking a bad situation and trying to make it good, it's let's take a bad situation, but let's take a step back and, and actually think about what are the ramifications of it and where am I really in this process? And so an example of a really trying time for me is, I moved out here and took this job with the Indians, you know, over three years ago and was miserable. Like I was happy at, at work. I loved what I was doing. It felt right. But then I was homesick so bad. I missed my, I needed my support system and all I want to do is go home. So what I felt was I felt trapped. I felt like the job was keeping me here and me being here was miserable, but the clear and obvious path is to continue excelling in professional baseball. That's what we should be doing. Right, Ryan? But it felt, it felt like a weight. And, and to be honest, like with the help of a therapist, was able to, to think and go, okay, so if I open up, you know, Expedia and I book a flight home tomorrow, what's going to happen? Well, I'm going to lose my job and, and you, know, I, you know, I don't want to end up on the street. Well, okay, slow down. You know, what's going to happen? Well, I probably would get in trouble. I'd have to call my boss. Okay, and if you decided to not come back to Phoenix, what would happen? I'd probably lose my job. Okay, do you think you'd be able to find another job? Yeah, I, I think I'd be able to find another job. Okay, so you would be living and you'd have potential opportunities, right? Yeah, okay, so go to your computer at home, open up Expedia, have the ticket ready, and just leave it there for a day or two. See how you feel. And I did that and it was like, oh, like I have the choice to make these decisions. My life's not crushing me. Is my situation at that time that I feel like I was in the best situation, a positive situation? No, not at the time but I was able to step back and think a little bit more neutrally, rationally and practically and say, okay, I have options still. This is my current situation. It's just like if, if you're going through a hard time financially, professionally, or if somebody passes away and you know, that, that you're close to, there's no, it's not a lot of positive spin to some of those things, but how can we work through those by thinking without distortions, without negative self-talk? Uh, those are the things that resonated for me beyond just uh, you know, a little bit more positive thinking. So it talked a little bit about therapy. So, and we talked again about this before, there's a big stigma. And with my job in the kind of the health industry with the hospital, I, I see a lot of people that will actually come to me as a health coach because I'm kind of an in-betweener where I'm not a friend and I'm not a therapist. I'm kind of this guy who might talk a little bit about that stuff, but it's, it doesn't have that stigma of, oh, I'm going to see a therapist. Oh, I'm going to see the health coach it doesn't sound as bad. How did you navigate that? How did you think about that? Was it a struggle to go reach out to a therapist? What was that experience like? Did you enjoy it? Like, tell me about that experience. Yeah, it, so I had hit a, hit a point where it basically was like critical mass. It was like, make, make a decision to get some sort of resource 
Um, or it may not, this may not go with, because I was still going in this, like, this great trajectory, like everything from the outside looked good. But at some point, I think people from the outside would be able to tell it's not going good if I didn't make a change. Um, and so it was a necessity. But once I was in therapy, uh, we, <laughs> I'll be honest with you, like I wanted the easy out, but we went the hard route, which was cognitive behavior therapy. It's challenging because it requires you to do work. And so I went to a lot of sessions for months where we talked through a lot of stuff. Like I felt like, oh, this is therapy. Like I tell them how my childhood was. And I tell them what bothers me now. And then I walk out feeling better. And I thought that's what it was about. But I learned what the distortions are, how, how we can have distorted thinking, how we can be biased. And then I was told to do homework assignments, like go home and fight the negative thoughts and really think, keep the distortion list with you. So you know what distortion, identify what distortion you have when you're thinking and write it down. And I just didn't do it. <laughs> just to be honest, like I didn't do it. And I didn't get better. You know, I felt like I was getting better, but I wasn't getting better. And then there was just a point where I'm going to give it a go. And it was one of the most challenging things I'd ever done because I actively fought every negative thought. And you never realize how many you have when you're in that place until you really try to counteract them. Like, man, I don't like what my body looks like. Well, you have distorted thinking. You've gone your whole life thinking that you were overweight. You're not overweight. You're fine, Ryan. And having to remind myself, like, you know, just to be candid, those are some of the things that I'd have to go through. So um, again, the same thing, man, my life, I, I'm miserable. I'm trapped. I can't get out of this. No, I have options. Like that's a distortion. Like, you know, so working through all of that, it was a really positive experience and slowly for me, weaned myself off of it. It was weekly sessions. Then it was every other week. Then it was once a month until finally was able to break from it. And I'll be honest, like I've, I've not talked to anybody about this openly. I've talked about recently, you know, Hey, depression has become something I've, I've been able to handle and, and make some progress in, but exercise dependence is something that I'm going through right now. You know, you just hit that point where it's like, Oh man, I've, I've worked out 60 or 70 straight days. And it's, this is not like, this is not good. Like it's healthy outlet. Sure. But it's, that's not like, it's taking away from other things in my life. So reached out for some help. Have... Sorry about that. I got a yeah. call come through. Um, same kind of pro process early on was a little bit skeptical going in with a, with a different therapist, taking a different approach, but slowly had to tell myself, Hey, if I don't work out today, like I'll be all right. And I have time to challenge myself in other ways. I don't need to challenge myself physically. I'm not an elite athlete. That's okay. Like I can challenge myself intellectually or, or mentally all, or just take a rest day, <laughs> you know, like it'll be okay. Um, and so that's something that I've actively been, been working through now. So it's still at this point on that weaning off process, like not talking to somebody as often, but the, the real epiphany for me has been, if you're somebody who wants to be a high performer in whatever you're doing, whether that's a baseball player, an executive, or like in my case, in this, like in a role where right now I'm starting to learn, like I'm managing people, not just athletes, but, but trying to manage and help develop and support and serve coaches and, you know, and people that are, have their own career aspirations. If I want to be elite in that, I have to take advantage of every resource. And for me, if I'm spending, in, in my specific case, if I'm spending an hour and a half a day working out and not taking rest days, even when I feel like taking rest days, well, I'm taking mental reserves and physical reserves away from time that I could be spending getting better to support those people or just working towards my career goals. There's so many hours in the day. So can I find somebody that can, just the way an athlete would have a mental performance coach just to help them hone in on their skills on the field. Can I have somebody that helps me work through some of the things that I struggle with mentally to help me perform, so to speak, at my best every day? And the answer is yes. We just, we call it therapy. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good way to put a, put a cap on that. Um, I'm glad that you talked through that because, again, kind of working in the field that I'm in, I see a lot of those same trends. And I guess I hadn't really thought about how important it is to talk about not only is it okay to talk about depression or feelings or things you're going through. Not only is it okay to think about reaching out to a therapist and going to a therapist, but then once you're in it, it's not just like, almost like you said, oh, you're just in it, you're talking about your feelings, you feel good, because that can give you almost that kind of shot of dopamine where you're like, oh, I'm feeling better, this is it, it's working. Mm -hmm. But like you said, there was, there was so much more to it. 
there's even sometimes where you'll find a therapist that you're not comfortable with. So that can be another dynamic. Yep. So that it's almost like it's, it's a huge step to get to therapy, but then there's other steps to really get the most out of it. So I'm glad you shared that because you talked about it, it was months that then it was later on weeks. Uh, Cause some people, they think, Hey, I need to go see therapy for whatever it is. It's a parent, it's a child, it's an athlete, it's a professional, whatever it is. And they have four sessions and they're expecting to be healed and great and they'll never need therapy again. So I think it's really important. I'm really glad that we were able to touch on that. So to kind of wrap all that up, um, is there any just other general advice that you would give to some of the athletes or people watching as far as you know, depression, anxiety, therapy? Yeah, I mean, some things that have really helped me um, personally, and I, and I hope they can help other people is I, I like to write, you know, so I'm, I'm not a creative person. Um, I'm very science oriented, and I like numbers. And um, so I don't paint, I don't draw, but I found that you know, early on journaling, just true journaling really helped me. But then a lot of times, um, the ability to just, just to have some place to, to a creative outlet outside of what I would normally do, because for me, and I'm thinking for an athlete as well, it's great that exercise training or your sport is your outlet, but that's also not your outlet. That's your passion. That's your hobby. That's for some people, their job, um, it's, it's their aspirational goal. There's more, there's so much more tied to it. And if you rig up your, your boat and attach it, you know, in terms of mental health, like that's my outlet too. Well, one day it might be gone. <laughs> and that's, you know, we talk about like, uh, oftentimes, uh, be, you know, your sport becoming your identity and that's not something you want. Well, you definitely don't want to tie your mental health to just the physical outlet as an athlete. It's, it's important. It helps blow off steam. Of course but I, having a creative outlet has really helped me. Um, even if I'm really bad at it, like it's just, it's something that I can do. And then trying to learn as much as I can because, and I'm not in the, not in the like, Oh, I want to learn more about science, but like reading things outside of my normal wheelhouse. So reading, you know, memoirs, biographies and things like that. So you can other understand other people's perspectives and what they've gone through. And it, it really, can help you interpret the world a little bit better. It's kind of like really existential big thoughts, but it's just like sometimes our biggest problem is just like figuring out where we fit in the world and like what we can become and who we are right now and reading or watching or listening. If your podcast, whatever it is, like we're just talking to people, right? Like finding other people around you and sharing experiences with them and hearing their journey is really helps you center where you're at in your own. And I think that's really important is to have that clarity because I think like uncertainty is one of the biggest contributors to anxiety or stress. Um, outside of that, the, the, the last thing is if you can be comfortable with yourself at all times, then all the other stuff may come and go, but who you are will be something that you can always be okay with. And okay doesn't mean great. Like you may not love every aspect of yourself right now, but if you don't chase loving yourself, chase accepting yourself right now. If you could do that, um, there might be anxiety from work and, and stress and school and money and all those things, but who you are, which is like the most important piece of it, will, will be that constant like North Star that just kind of keeps you going in the right direction even when it seems like you're off. And I appreciate all of that, all the insights, all the stories, all the analogies. I mean, th this has been, I think, super beneficial for so many different reasons. Um, so I just truly thank you for all of this. No, I appreciate the platform. It's a great discussion and any opportunity that, that, uh, that I can have to kind of reach out to some, some younger people, like that's, uh, it's a win in my book. So I, I really do appreciate it in the time. Yeah. So where can people follow you if they want to kind of see what you're up to? Yeah, so the biggest place for me is if you use social media, and I get razzed by my employees all the time for how much I put out there, but I uh, like to give a shout out to Ryan Horn. He's a strength coach at Wake Forest. He talks about social media for him being a, like kind of a digital journal to, to kind of chronicle his, you know, hit the journey he's going through. And I try to like to do the same thing. And, and so for me, if, if you on Twitter, it's, it's at Ryan, and that's R-Y-A-N underscore f-a-e-r and same thing with instagram um and if you want to reach out I, i'll be honest i'm tough about getting back in, in direct messages on those 
but my email, uh, my work email is R F A E R at Indians.com. So my first initial, my last name at Indians.com. We're glad to, to connect and, and, and talk with anybody offline. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it. We'll talk off the air real quick, but for everyone tune in. Thank you very much. I hope you got a ton out of this. If you caught in or got in here a little bit later, this will be on YouTube in the next couple of days. So go ahead and uh, check that out over there and we will see you next week for episode 20. Thanks y'all.